as soon as you see a problem, what is the first thing that you do? You look up a test case and then you decide, okay, I want to scan all of these elements. There are multiple ways to do it. You can either use a two pointer approach or you can also use a fast pointer and a slow pointer. But sometimes there is a thought that comes to your mind that, okay, I need to remember this element somehow so I can come at a solution. As soon as this thought hits your mind, it means you will either want to use a hash map or a hash set. And that is the pattern we are going to talk about in this video. Hello friends, welcome back to my channel. First of all, we need to understand what do you actually mean by a hash map and a hash set. These two are very essential data structures which are available in almost every programming language. Yes, they take up some space but they give you a time complexity of order of one when you have to look up elements. So how do they work? For example, this is how you can imagine a hash set to be. In a hash set, you can never have any duplicates. So for example, if I try to add numbers like two, three, and then a five, and then let us say I try to add a two again, this two will not make an entry in your hash set because two already exists. Similarly, you can add more distinct elements. It is guaranteed that any time you check your hash set, all of the elements will be unique. One more advantage that you get is you can query all of these elements in a constant time. For example, you can immediately ask, hey, is the number three in my hash set? And with the order of one time complexity, you will either return a true or a false. If a number does not exist, you can still ask, hey, is 11 in my hash set? It does not exist, so you will get a false. This is the basic idea of a hash set. Somehow you are trying to remember, okay, these are all the unique elements that I have encountered. And it is not necessary that all of these have to be integers. They can be strings. They can be also objects. It is up to you to decide what do you want to do with it. Similarly, you also have the concept of a hash map. In a hash map, you will have a key and a value, but all of these keys, they are guaranteed to be unique. You can assign different type of keys with different type of values. For example, your keys can be all integers and your values could be string as well. And at any instant, none of these values will be duplicated. You can have duplicated values. This is perfectly fine, but you cannot have a two over here. This is the advantage that a hash map gives you. And once again, it will take up a order of n extra space, where n is the number of elements you are trying to store in your map. But the advantage you get is you can query all of these values in a constant time. So you can straight away ask, okay, is two present in my map. So you will get either a true or a false. And you can ask one more information. What is the value associated with two? So you will return CD. So we are getting two advantages over here. You can either ask in your map is the key present. So this is very similar to a hash set, but at the same time, you also get to store a certain value that is associated with it. This is the basic understanding how hash maps and hash sets work. So before we try to understand even more, let us quickly take a look at some very familiar examples and then you will start to get an idea about it. I'm pretty sure you must have heard about this problem to some, but this time your array is unsorted. The idea over here is you are given an unsorted array and you have to tell me if there are any two integers available that sum up to a particular number. Let us say the desired sum is 10. So how do you approach it? A brute force way will be that you will pick up two elements every time and then try to find out the sum. This will take up a time complexity of order of n square, but you can do something efficient. What you can do is you can pick up a hash set. In this set, first of all, add all the numbers that are available to you. Immediately, I can query if any of this number is present. So how do you approach it? You take up this number minus two. And then if you want to find another number such that minus two plus of X gives you 10. So what should be the value of X? X should be 12, correct? If 
12 was present in my array. Then you got the answer. But how do you scan for 12? You don't want to iterate over your array again. This is where this set comes in. You will immediately look up if 12 prevent in my hash set. No. So it means 2 cannot be a part of your answer. What about minus 5 now? You need minus 5 plus of 15 to get 10. Correct? So you look up. Can you find a 15? No. So this also cannot be a part of your answer. Can you use 6? To get 10, you will need a 4. Correct? So you can now search, hey, is 4 prevent in my hash set? Yes. You found a value. So you can say that, okay, 6, 4 are the two integers which will add up to give you the result 10. You can see how hash set gave us advantage. The time complexity changed from order of n square to order of 2n, which is relatively just order of n because you are scanning the array only twice. But keep in mind that you used up extra order of n space to arrive at this efficient solution. Let us move on to another problem now. Over here, you are given a Sudoku board and you have to verify if this Sudoku board is actually valid or not. If you remember, what are the rules of Sudoku? For each of these small squares, you should have numbers from 1 to 9. And for each of these columns, you should also have the numbers from 1 to 9. And this should be true for each of the columns. Again, all of these rows, they should have numbers from 1 to 9. If any row or any column or any of the smaller squares, they have duplicate numbers, it is not a valid Sudoku. So what does this tell you? You have to again think, okay, have I encountered this number before? Is there a duplicate? Immediately, you should use a hash set. So what are we going to do over here? We can create individual hash sets for each of these smaller squares. So you are going to have nine of these hash sets for each of the smaller squares. Then you can have individual hash sets for each of your rows. And then similarly, you can have individual hash sets for your columns also. For each of these hash sets, you will try to add all of the numbers. So take up your first square and add all of these numbers. Take up your second square and add all of these numbers. Similarly, do this for each of the square that you're encountering. If at any instance, you see that a number was already present in your set, that means this Sudoku is not valid. If you have iterated over entire elements and find that, okay, I'm not finding any duplicates, then this Sudoku is valid. For example, try to notice what will happen when I'm going over this row. So for a row, I'm going to take up this hash set. I start adding the elements. I add a one here, then I add a two, then five, then three. And then what do I see? I see a two again. Two is already present. So immediately this Sudoku is not valid at all. Also, if you notice closely, we have multiple eights in the same column. So this Sudoku is not valid with multiple causes. But what did we do? In just a single iteration, we were able to verify if this Sudoku is valid or not. So what are we doing over here? How are we identifying if you can apply the hash map or a hash fit pattern? Basically, you should be asking yourself some different kind of questions. Go over the problem statement and try to think about a solution. Try to think how do you want to scan your elements? And if some of these thoughts come to your mind, for example, you have to find duplicates. That is a very good indicator. You would need a hash fit because in constant time, you can determine if a number has been duplicated or not. Similarly, you might want to count frequencies. So you are given a string and you want to know how many times a character is appearing. Once again, you need a hash map because you can immediately pinpoint if the number is present or not. And then what is the frequency? So what are we doing? We are trying to track the state of a particular element that have I encountered this before? And what was its current state? It could be frequency. It could just be the existence also. I hope this is now giving you an idea where you can apply this pattern. Let us continue to solve more problems and you are going to see how fast the process is. For example, I have this problem over here, zero stripping. The problem says that you are given a matrix like this. If you see a zero anywhere, then 
this entire column and the entire row, they should all get converted to zeros. That is the desired output. If you check over here, all of these elements have converted to zero. And for this particular zero, both the rows and columns have converted to zero. When you solve this problem, you cannot just start iterating. And then as soon as you see a zero, you cannot mark all of these elements as zero because you have to travel further also. And if you do this, then all of these columns will start getting to mark zero. But that is not what we desire. So somehow you need to remember that, okay, I need to make this column as zero and make this row as zero. So once again, you got your hint. What you will do is you will make a row hash set and you will make a column hash set. In your row hash set, you write down which rows you want to make zero. So I want to make row one as zero and I want to make row three as zero. Which columns I want to make zero? I want to make column one as zero and column four as zero. Now what you can do, you have iterated over every element. Just look at these particular rows and columns and mark them as zero. That's it. Once again, with just one scan, you were able to arrive at your solution. This next problem is one which I really like. You are given this array and you have to tell me the longest chain of consecutive integers that you can find. So if you notice, you can find one chain, one, two, and three. You cannot find a four, so you can stop. Similarly, you can also find five, six, seven, eight. This is also a chain. This is longer for four elements. So over here, this is the answer. But you may ask, okay, how can I apply a hash set or a hash map over here? While scanning through the array, you need to somehow remember that have I seen a smaller element than this? Try to think. If I am looking at the element one, if in my array, I had a zero also, that means zero would be the starting point of a chain, correct? If I cannot find an element smaller than one, it means this is the starting point of probably a new chain, correct? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take up a hash fit and then I add up all of my numbers. Now what you can do, start off with the first element. You need to look for a zero. Can you find a zero in this set? No, it means this is probably the starting of a new sequence. And this lookup happened immediately. You don't have to waste time. So now what you can do, you can look for two. And do you find a two? Yes. What is the next element that you have to look for? You need to look for three. You can find a three also. Can you find a four in here? No, it means I found one of the length as one, two and three. This is my one chain that I found. Now you move ahead and you get the element six. Either this element six will start a new chain or it will be a part of some other longer chain. To be a part of other longer chain, you must have five in your array also, correct? So you will look for five. Can you find it? Yes. It simply means that six is not the starting point. So I'm not gonna do any more iterations with it. I will just skip this number because this isn't starting a new chain. Go to two. Can you find a one over here? Yes. It means two is also not starting a new chain. Look at the next element. Can you find a four in your set? No. It means five is the start of a new chain. So I need to find out how big my chain is. So with five, I'm going to look up six. Then I'm going to look up seven. Then I look up eight. Can I find a nine? No. So I can stop over here. And what did I find? I found five, six, seven, eight. This is another chain that I found and its length is four. This is longer, correct? Now move ahead. For eight, can you find seven? Yes. So don't do anything. For seven, can you find a six? Yes. Don't do anything. For 10, can you find a nine? No, but you can't find 11 either. For three, can you find a two? Yes. So you don't have to do anything. So what did we just do? We did one scan to add all of the numbers to our set. And in the other scan, we were able to easily determine, hey, what is my longest chain that I can found? So once again, we are just taking up order of n extra space to find all of these efficient solutions. What about hash sets now? And what about strings? 
Valid anagram is a perfect example how you can use them. What are anagrams? Anagrams are simply two strings where all of its characters are just rearranged. They are the same characters and the same frequencies. So how can you use a hash effect? I have my first string over here. Just iterate over each of the character and add them to your hash set. So when you add all of these characters, you get their frequencies as well. A is 1, D is 1, M is 1, I is 1, R appears 2 times and E appears just 1 time. Notice that I can do all of these lookups in just order of 1 time. So I will just increment their frequencies. Next, what you're gonna do? Take up the second string and iterate over each of the character. For each of the character, you will do immediate lookups with order of one time. And eventually, you are gonna reduce the frequency of each of the character that you are encountering. At the very end, if all of these frequencies have become zero, it means the frequencies match and the characters match. So these two strings are anagrams. But if any of the character did not match, or if you had an extra character, for example, there was an X over here. You will try to look up this X in here. You can't find it, so you can simply return a false. This makes life so much simpler, correct? And based upon a similar idea, you can solve multiple other problems also. For example, contains duplicates. You are given a string and you have to find out if it has duplicates or not. Just add them to a set and if you encounter it again, you have a duplicate. Intersection of two arrays. You want to find out if these arrays have an intersection point. Just take up all of the elements of the first array and add it to a set. Then take up the second array and iterate over each of the elements one by one. As soon as you find something that is already present in your hash set, that is the intersection point. Similarly, you can have one more example, the first unique character in a string. So let us say you have a string like A, B, C, A, B. What do you do? Add all of these characters to a hash set and store their frequencies. The first character that you see that has a frequency of one, that is your answer. We just solved so many problems, right? And this is the power of hash sets and hash maps. Basically, you are storing some kind of an extra state. You are not just storing an element just like an array. You are also containing the information that this element appears only once or has this appeared earlier also. Similarly, it gives you order of one lookup time and that is a very essential feature. It just takes constant time to query the set and determine if it is present or not. Similarly, it keeps your logic clean and as you know, it also reduces the time complexity. You went from order of n square time to mostly order of n time. And that is because you are reusing some of the information. You avoided an extra loop to look up that information and you use your hash set. But always keep in mind that using a hash set or a hash map can take up extra space. So you might want to use it with caution. But it is good in scenarios where you have a constant sample size. For example, you are dealing with the characters of English alphabet you know that there can be a maximum of 26 characters. So you're not taking up order of n space, but you're only taking up constant space. So the space complexity actually turns out to be order of one rather than order of n. So these are some of the examples where a hash set and a hash map can actually make your life very, very simple. Just tell me in the comment section below where all have you used this particular pattern and this will really become a very good collection for all of these such kind of problems. I would be happy to discuss and contribute to the collection as well. As a reminder, if you found this video helpful, please do consider subscribing to my channel and share this video with your friends. This really keeps me motivated and I can make more such videos. Also, now you can schedule a one-to-one -one session with me to have a direct interaction and solve any sort of doubts. A huge shout out to all of the members who support my channel. You guys really keep me going. And as a member, you do get priority reply to your comments and early access to new videos as well. Stay tuned for my upcoming video. Until then, see ya.